One is that um, at least there were uh, before uh, on the table uh, uh, outside a couple of uh, copies left of the rule of law handbook from the Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School. I'm not advocating this handbook because I'm one of the co-editors. I'm advocating it because my co-editor Kate Garove uh, was one of the co-editors and, and she's here today. Um, and then for those of you who are taking part in the separate uh, uh, expert working groups tomorrow, um, we will be meeting in McDonough, which is the main law school building, not in this building, um, and specifically in McDonough room 492. But uh, access to uh, McDonough is controlled. You'll want to enter on the second street entrance. Your name uh, will be uh, uh, with the security desk there. If you have any questions about, if you're, if you're on the working groups tomorrow, if you have any questions about it, talk to uh, Major Anderson or me, uh, but preferably Major Anderson uh, about that. So uh, now we'll have Dave Kaplow come up. Dave, are you here? All right, it's right here. Thanks. Okay, if we could come to order. I know it's been a very busy and full day already, but the calendar presses us forward, and I know you're eager to hear our keynote speaker, Jay Johnson. My name is David Coplow. I'm a faculty member here at Georgetown Law, and it's my proud duty to serve as one of, one of the introducers for our keynote speaker. Uh, ordinarily, of course, a keynote speech comes at the start of a conference of this sort, as the speaker introduces the themes that will be developed during the course of the day. Or perhaps a keynote speech comes in the middle of the conference at lunch while you're eating. But here, we're all about change. <laughs> we're all about modifying the form to fit the substance and to take advantage of the opportunity to have uh, Mr. Johnson here as a guest speaker. So um, as I said, my, my first job is to, uh, to introduce him. Uh, Jay Johnson has been the general counsel of the Department of Defense for about six weeks now. And in that capacity, he provides the senior advice to the Secretary of Defense, to the other senior officials in the department, and to the interagency community on the full range of legal issues that affect and afflict the Department of Defense. And these days, everything has a legal side, and therefore, Mr. Johnson's responsibilities cover the full gamut from procurement and contracting to personnel and health policy, intelligence law, international relations law, contracts and acquisitions, uh, a very broad portfolio indeed. In addition, he supervises literally thousands of lawyers in his own immediate office, in the subordinate civilian agencies, in the military services around Washington, across the country, and around the world a very daunting set of tasks. Fortunately, Mr. Johnson comes to these tasks very well prepared. He uh, is a graduate of Morehouse College and Columbia Law School. He has experience as both a civil lawyer and a criminal lawyer working in the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York and for the Paul Weiss Law Firm. And during the Clinton administration, he served for more than two years as the uh, general counsel of the Air Force. He's also, notably, a close confidant and advisor to President Obama, both during the campaign and during the transition, and it's no surprise, therefore, that one of the President's first most senior, positions, senior appointments uh, early in the administration in the department was to, to designate Mr. Johnson as, uh, as general counsel. Um, uh, Closer to the concerns of this conference, it will be among his leading responsibilities to restore a measure of confidence and, uh, and trust in the military justice system and to uh, take the actions that President Obama campaigned for to restore the appreciation for the rule of law in the U.S. military justice system. Um, as I said, I am only one of two introducers, and General Chipman has some comments to make as well. 
The reason we have two introductions is you need a personal introduction and you need an institutional introduction. I will provide the latter. Sir, before you got here, what we found out was that this administration has inherited the most daunting foreign policy challenges ever. Tom Ricks told us that at lunchtime. Uh, and as well, that's not their first problem. So you've only got the second most daunting set of problems confronting the new administration, foreign policy, under, under your watch, sir. So uh, when you took office on February the 10th, you issued a memo the first day you took office. And there are two points I'd like to tell this audience from the memo that you issued. And it was to the about 20,000 legal personnel that are in the defense legal service enterprise. If you think about that number and you talk about capacity, think about that number and what we can do with that uh, number of lawyers and legal personnel. And the two points I'd like to mention are adherence to the rule of law permits us to occupy the moral high ground and display the very best of American values. And secondly, I, w I will institute a collegial and collaborative working relationship between the civilian and military lawyers, which goes a long way toward timely, effective, and quality legal services and legal advice. Throughout our panels today, we've had that uh, discussion and examination of the role of military lawyers and the military in general and our civilian counterparts in instituting the rule of law in two very difficult environments, Iraq and Afghanistan and anywhere else we may be engaged in operations around the globe. And yet we also know that it can't be a military function alone. Uh, we have great civilian capability both within the department and within the interagency, that noun that doesn't exist, as well as in our NGO communities. And so, sir, with uh, your background as a Justice Department lawyer in the private sector and with prior experience in the department, we look forward to your leadership on this compelling range of issues. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have to say to uh, <clears throat> the two of you who gave me the kind introductions, I, I, I've been in the job of general counsel of the Defense Department for five and a half weeks now, and I have already learned that I never talk about the number of lawyers that I have in the Department of Defense, because when you tell people in any command how many people you have within your command, somebody wants to take them away from you. Um, so when I was, for example, when I was general counsel of the Air Force and I would say I had, you know, 1,700 uh, JAGs in the Air Force, um, some, some European ministers of defense or European uh, air forces would say, do you realize you have more lawyers in your air force and we have people in ours? And um, so when people ask me, well, how many lawyers do you have in the Department of Defense? I refine my answer to DOD general counsel and then I give the standard bureaucratic answer, which it depends on how you count. You know, billets, people, I have two people in one billet and, and so it's, who knows? Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me. Um, this is my first um, um, set of remarks uh, in my new official capacity. Um, the topic of this conference, as all of you know, is the role of the military in promoting the rule of law. The topic is a timely one for me because I was in Iraq and Afghanistan just two weeks ago where I observed firsthand our efforts in those countries. My remarks this afternoon are my own, do not reflect official Department of Defense or U.S. government policy. So everyone always hears that and says, oh boy, what is he going to say? Um, promoting the rule of law is, in fact, one of the cornerstones of the national security policy of this new administration. And it is one of the reasons I joined this administration, because I believe that the concept is a necessary part of the effort to combat international terrorism. At the outset, it should be noted that reference to the rule of law means different things in different contexts, and we have to be careful how we use it. The term has a political connotation and carries some political baggage. To many, rule of law sounds a conservative theme. Some old enough to remember Richard Nixon's Law and Order Society of the late 1960s bristle at the term. During the Obama campaign, I had a debate with an old-line ACLU attorney who did not like the term, 
because it suggested to him the image of an authoritarian government. Love it or leave it, a requirement that we all swear allegiance to the law no matter what, and that it is disloyal or unpatriotic ever to want to change it through public advocacy or peaceful civil disobedience. Obviously, that is not what we mean. Uh, some of you in this audience have heard me talk about a chapter from my own family history, the so-called Freeman Field Mutiny. I had two uncles who were Tuskegee Airmen. One of them, Lieutenant Robert B. Johnson, was a bombardier navigator in the Army Air Corps assigned to Freeman Field in Indiana in April 1945. At the time, the base commander had a rule requiring that the officers' clubs on the base be segregated, white only. Lieutenant Johnson and about 100 other Tuskegee Airmen on base said no to that and demanded entry into the club. They were ordered to leave. The next day, the base commander asked all the officers on base to sign a document acknowledging awareness of the rule that the officers' clubs were segregated. The Tuskegee Airmen refused to sign. Next, the commander, armed with a legal opinion from the then chief legal officer of the Army, rounded up all the Tuskegee Airmen and told them it was a time of war, that it was a capital offense to violate an order during a time of war, and ordered them again to sign. And again, they refused. For their disobedience, my uncle and the other colored airmen were sent to a military prison in Kentucky to be confined alongside German POWs prior to the passage of the law that now prohibits such a thing. Eventually, General Marshall learned of the incident and told the base commander to knock it off. In that instance, who was promoting the rule of law? The base commander, armed with his base rule and a supporting legal opinion from an Army JAG, or my uncle, armed only with the idealistic notion of what the Equal Protection Clause should be and eventually became. My point here is that for Americans, reference to the rule of law can be complicated, annotated by references in history such as this one. Reference to the rule of law is a good bumper sticker message, but we need to be careful with it because it means different things in different contexts. In Iraq, our rule of law initiatives have largely involved reviving the pre-Saddam Hussein system, pre-Saddam Hussein system, including more progressive measures to protect individual rights. In Afghanistan, our efforts are nothing short of creating a system where, in many places, none exist at all. From 1996 to 2001, Afghanistan simply had no functioning legitimate government. Domestically, reference to the rule of law in last year's political debate as a goal for our new administration and one of my personal goals in office means respect by the most powerful in our government for the laws that we as a society create for ourselves as a weapon to gain credibility and the moral high ground in the international struggle against terrorists. <laughs> in these remarks, I'd like to discuss all three. Shortly before the Iraq war was launched in 2003, Secretary of State Colin Powell, as many of you know, reportedly warned President Bush of the so-called pottery barn rule. You break it, you own it. When we go into a sovereign nation and push out its ruling government, we assume a moral obligation to the people there who, as a result of our actions, may find themselves with no army, no police, no running water or electricity. The pottery barn rule is also codified in international law. In Article 43 of the Fourth Hague Convention, quote, the authority of a legitimate power having in fact passed into the hands of the occupant, the latter shall take all the measures in his power to restore and ensure as far as possible public order and safety while respecting, unless absolutely prevented, the laws in force in the country. After six years and much cost in human life and tax dollars, it appears we have turned the corner in Iraq. Thanks to the dedication and bravery of our military, levels of violence are way down to a fraction of what they were as recently as two years ago. While in Iraq, one of my most memorable experiences was visiting with the nation's Chief Justice, Medhat. <coughs> Appointed by the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq, Chief Justice Medhat remains in office and is regarded by many as a courageous leader of a judiciary that has made great progress toward independence and credibility as part of the new government. Chief, Chief Justice Medat personally deserves much of the credit for that progress. 
I met with the Chief Justice late one night in a heavily guarded apartment building where he lives, and he described to me with pride the history of the courts in Iraq and the progress that has been made. Our Army Corps of Engineers has executed numerous construction projects throughout Iraq, supporting the courts, police, and correction services, and our judge advocates in Iraq have been instrumental in helping to coordinate our overall rule of law efforts there, in addition to their normal duties as lawyers for commanders. A word about our JAGs. In Iraq and Afghanistan, they work long hours in difficult conditions. In the corporate law world, where I come from, many of us are accustomed to comfortable surroundings to cushion the demands of practice and long hours. In Kabul, I visited the law office of the staff judge advocate there. The hours there are from about 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night for each JAG. The windows at that particular office were boarded up because they had been shattered by glass from a near su nearby suicide bomb only weeks before. A 21-year-old Army reservist, while I was there, died of her wounds from the blast. I met with the JAGs there and probed to learn if there was anything I could do to pro provide for them, make their lives a little easier back home. I asked, are you having trouble meeting your CLE requirements over here? Can I get you some relief, bar association dues? In the middle of this very dangerous place, forward deployed in those conditions, no one wanted to complain about anything. The government in Iraq has evolved to the point where last year it was in a position to negotiate with us a security agreement that requires that all U.S. forces be out of the country by the end of 2011. In Iraq, as I've said, we've turned the corner and we have an exit strategy. In Afghanistan, our efforts are nowhere near this far along and await direction as part of an overall strategy that the administration is currently in the progress, in the process of developing. Our rule of law initiatives there are scattered and have been under-resourced when compared with our activities in Iraq. And I fear that a successful effort in Afghanistan along these lines will require much more than our effort in Iraq. While in Afghanistan, I was struck by the degree of poverty and the lack of an infrastructure. The average life expectancy of an Afghan male is 44 years. Even in the urban center of Kabul, in much of the city, there is no electricity, no running water, and no drainage. Except for the dusty automobiles, a street scene in Kabul in March 2009 could be mistaken for a street scene in March 1909 or 1809. Donkeys, skin goats, mud everywhere. On the perimeter of our air base in Bagram are mud huts where people live and children herd goats and play amidst old landmines buried in the fields from the Russian invasion. Not far away, one can see the rusted remains of Russian tanks and trucks from the occupation, a stark reminder of the hazards for any outsider there. Some have said that Afghanistan is not really a nation. It is more a series of tribes that happen to reside within a national border. Most of the population is indeed tribal and is largely untouched by any system of laws as we know them or a court system. In tribal Afghanistan, the punishment and compensation for a felony com committed by a member of one tribe visited on another tribe is resolved by the tribal elders and may involve the transfer of a young woman into a forced marriage in the victim tribe. You and I would regard this as a crude form of ADR, alternative dispute resolution. But in Afghanistan, this is not the alternative. This is the cultural norm. The courts are the alternative for both criminal offenses and civil disputes. But even when the courts are utilized, corruption is often part of the package. In Afghanistan, my MOD counterpart does not have a law degree from a graduate school. And the newly formed Bar Association in Afghanistan has, I'm told, only several hundred members in it. On top of all this, whatever wealth there is in Afghanistan comes about from the illegal drug trade. Any policy for a new U.S. direction in Afghanistan must take account of these harsh realities, as well as the harsh lessons learned from our recent experience in Iraq. Whether in Iraq or Afghanistan, our rule of law efforts must be constrained by the art of the possible, sensitivity to the culture of the country, and the realization that much of our laws and system of justice reflect our Western culture and not their culture. The other thing we must be sensitive to is the very real possibility 
that a soldier with a gun and a uniform may not be the ideal messenger for change. Rule of law initiatives must be an interagency process involving our partners at state and justice. Finally, there is the rule of law as it pertains to our own nation and how we project ourselves on the world stage. It hangs over our first two initiatives in Iraq and Afghanistan and all that we do to combat international terrorism. Like our president, I believe we must lead not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example, and that human rights abuses and failures by our own government to follow the rule of law actually harm our national security interest and serve as a recruitment tool for al-Qaeda and related terrorist organizations in the communities in which they recruit. As a result of our broad assertions of executive authority, we also find ourselves in a situation where the executive's actions are today actually given less deference in the courts, as we are forced to justify our detention decisions to skeptical judges, many of whom were appointed by the prior administration in hundreds of cases in litigation. This is why this administration has made adherence to the rule of law a cornerstone, cornerstone of our national security policy in the international struggle against terrorism. Our professional warfighters teach that terrorists will not be defeated by conventional means. They will not surrender by signing a peace treaty on the deck of a battleship. We combat terrorists by occupying the moral high ground, by marginalizing and discrediting the extremists in the communities in which they exist, thereby limiting their ability to recruit in these communities. The strategy is simple capture or kill those who go through the training camps and take up arms against us at a rate faster than their leaders can recruit new ones. Human rights abuses at the hands of our government constitute self-inflicted wounds because they bolster enemy recruitment and undermine that strategy. This is one of my guiding principles in office, and I am pleased that on his second full day in office, President Obama signed the three executive orders closing Guantanamo appointing a task forces to find a new detention policy and a new interrogation policy for our government. Those task forces have begun their work, and the senior most officials of our government, the Attorney General, Secretary Gates, Secretary Clinton, Director Blair, and Director Panetta, are personally involved in these efforts. Here I want to spend a moment on the filing we made in court last Friday concerning the detention of enemy combatants the new definition of enemy combatant that we had been using to defend habeas cases brought by Guantanamo detainees. This filing and the new definition have received a fair amount of um, press. Three judges in those cases had ordered the Department of Justice to inform them whether the new administration wished to make any refinements, quote unquote, to the definition. And we had to tell them by March 13th. We lawyers, you know, we um, we like to say, I don't need time to give me a deadline. So it's remarkable what you can do when you have a deadline. Um, so we took them up on the invitation. The New York Times reported the change and suggested that the changes appeared largely cosmetic. Uh, that was the thrust of the story I read in the New York Times. Uh, the Times, however, fails to appreciate the significance of what we did, which reflects the President's personal views on this subject. To be sure, the President has the authority as Commander-in-Chief to direct military actions without congressional authorization in times of emergency or exigent threat to American lives or national security. In regard to detention, however, the new definition by its terms relies on the authority of the President to detain rooted in authorizations granted by Congress. In this case, the authorization for the use of military force passed shortly after 9-11 as opposed to the Commander-in-Chief authority in the Constitution, as informed by international law embodied in the laws of war. This is in accord, as I said, with the President's personal views of his authority. The new definition reflects our broader new approach to the role of the law, the rule of law, in our society. The just trust us approach to empowering senior officials to decide whether an individual enjoys the protection of our laws, based entirely upon the discretion of an individual to label you an enemy combatant or not, is fraught with problems. 
even when the system is populated with senior officials with the best of intentions, those individuals in the short term eventually resign, lose elections, or serve out their terms. It is basic human nature that broad government authority conferred upon some will be abused by others. In my lifetime, in the 1950s and 60s, before the label enemy combatant became commonplace in our vocabulary, civil liberties and rights of privacy were lost for many simply upon the application by some in our government of the term dangerous communist subversive. As I told you at the outset of this speech, my own uncle became a detainee, care of our US military, simply because a JAG in a time of war found within the law the discretion to punish someone who dared assert his basic right to equal treatment in this country. So in this speech, I have described three separate efforts in support of the rule of law. Our efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan are vital, but the last effort is, in my view, the most important to our long-term security and peace. Thank you very much. I was afraid David was going to ask me that. Can I take some questions? Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have a microphone? Oh, yes. Keep in mind, I've only been in office five and a half weeks. <laughs> All right, keep in mind that this is the time of the semester when you don't yet have to worry about an exam just around the corner. So if you've got an actual question, this is the time to turn it on him. <laughs> yes, sir. sir. Hi. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the new position. My name is Harvey Murdoch. I'm at the National War College and also the ABA Standing Committee on National Security. And you've raised very, very powerful questions about our, the new administration's view of rule of law. As you know, internationally, we are not signatories to Protocol 1. We are not signatories to Protocol 2. We are, have not joined the International Criminal Court. We are not signatories to the Law of the Sea Convention. Mm -hmm. And we have not also signed on on the Ottawa Convention. So these are positions that have, we've taken over the last administration. And I'm curious as to what your position is on what the new administration's view is going to be about all these new international conventions, which we have chosen not to be participatory, which is the rest of the world sees as sort of the new international law. Well, uh, the easy answer to that question is my position is the administration's position. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, and, you know, my position is the position that our president took in the course of the campaign. Um, let me focus on the uh, Law of the Sea Convention. Um, virtually everybody that I can find supports the Law of the Sea Convention. This administration, this president when he was a senator, the prior administration, a majority of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I think it got voted out of committee uh, by some lopsided vote of something like 17 to 3, but for some reason it never made it to the Senate floor. and. There are um, lots of people in the building, uh, particularly in the United States Navy, that say that it is in our vital national security interest to become ratified members of the Law of the Sea Convention. And um, there is a view, which I embrace, that even though you decide to follow you know, the contours of, of the treaty uh, and follow traditional international law principles, better to be a player at the table within the convention rather than be without it. And so, you know, I think the arguments for the uh, Law of the Sea Convention and, and getting it through the Senate are, are pretty compelling from a number of contexts. And uh, I know it is a, a goal of this administration to um, try to push that through at some point. And it's one of the things on, on my to-do list, so as given to me by the, uh, by the United States Navy. So. Um, I, I hope that hope that helps you. So. Yes, sir. I'm back. Travis uh, Owens, I'm with the U.S. Navy uh, JAG, with Office of Military Commissions on the defense side, and I'm not going to ask you a commission's question. Um, I wanted to ask you this. You know, I'm, I'm about to adopt a son from Ethiopia. I'm sorry, say that again? I'm about to adopt a son from Ethiopia. Yes. I, I would like to know, from your perspective, having risen to the position you've risen to, um, what's, what is the number one lesson that I should tell my son, you know, um, 
you know, I'm, I'm sitting watching President Obama come into power, uh, the, the Attorney General come into power, and now I see you as an African American in such a powerful position. What's the number one lesson that you would say I should tell my son for, you know, surviving in, in the United States of America? Um, well, that's uh, thank you for that question. Um, my uh, my first name, by the way, is Liberian. Um, my um, my grandfather was a was a diplomat, and he was sent over to Liberia by the um, League of Nations in 1930 to do a study on a, an act, a slave market in the um, indigenous population in Liberia. And apparently, the only person who would help him was a member of the indigenous population who spelled his name J E H. So my grandfather gave the name to my father who gave the name to me, and I gave it to my son. So there are exactly three J. Johnsons in the world who spell their name J-E-H. At least there are three that I know about. And um, at one point um, during, the, um, during the beginning of the campaign, uh, the, the president, now then Senator Obama, and I joked that 2008 would be the year of the American with the funny black, uh, you know, African name. Uh, um, but... Um, um, I would say that um, uh, 2008 demonstrates uh, that anything is possible. Um, that, and I, I was told this when I graduated law school by uh, Andrew Young, who was our commencement speaker. And I remember this. I mean, very few people remember what is said in commencement speeches, but I remember this. He said that if you if you if you work hard and you persevere you will accomplish in your lifetime things that are beyond your comprehension as you sit here graduating. And he talked about how he had participated in sit-ins in the early 60s, and he was at that point contemplating a run for governor of Georgia. And that would have been beyond his wildest imagination um, in the, you know, as recently as 20 years before. And, um, Lots of times I, in speeches more recently, refer back to 50s, 60s, you know, when I was, when I was younger, 70s. And um, it is certainly beyond um, the comprehension that I would have had 20 years ago to see that we are where we are today as a, as a nation um, with an African-American president and uh, the things that we've accomplished just Recently, and so I would say to your, I would say to your son that, um, particularly with an officer of the United States Navy as your dad, um, you will in your lifetime as an American um, accomplish and see things that. How old is your How old is your son? I'll get him probably in about four or five months. Four or five about months. Two years old. Tell him that if he works hard and perseveres, um, that he will accomplish and see things in his lifetime that are well beyond the comprehension he could have as a young man. So, any other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Ilya Shapiro, keep up, uh, keep up the good work you're doing. By the way. Ilya Shapiro from the Cato Institute. Um, with the understanding that the um, detainee policy is under review by a commission, um, what can you say about uh, how detainees, in your view, that's you know off the record and only represents your own view, um, uh, that detainees should be treated uh, depending on depending on where they're captured, depending on the circumstances that are captured and where they're being held. You know, should somebody who's captured in Afghanistan or Iraq and kept there have different rights than someone who's captured there but transferred to? Um, some third country or to a naval brig in the United States or, you know, Guantanamo no longer being an option, a, I don't know, a ship in international waters, all these different things, you know, on, on what should uh, the treatment and the rights attending uh, detainees uh, turn on? Well, um, we uh, readily embrace the notion that detainee treatment uh, uh, anywhere in the world by U.S. military, U.S. government personnel is subject to common Article 3. And um, certainly for the U.S. military, we uh, em readily embrace that detainees should be treated consistent with the Army Field Manual. And uh, our JAG community in particular is very proud of the, the Army Field Manual. Um, 
There is uh, litigation uh, pending in the courts um, that have the potential of extending the reach of habeas to detainees in Afghanistan. Um, I am concerned that the warfighter uh, not be put in a position where they have to think about that the, the warfighter should be allowed to accomplish their essential mission. And what I've said a number of times is that we should not be putting warfighters in a position where they have to think about, you know, a law enforcement function when they're out there in the battlefield or when they're out there in forward deployed areas. And so we should not expect um, the warfighters to have to think about Mirandizing people that they, they capture. Um, and there's the, the laws of war prism, and then there's the law enforcement prism. And until our lawmakers come up with a perhaps a different regime of rules to try to accommodate our post-9-11 world, um, we have to avoid confusing the two and expect our warfighters to function as, as law enforcement as law enforcement agents. But, you know, the questions of how you treat somebody depending on where they are in, in one part or of the world or another are complicated questions. We will work those out as part of our um, executive order review, hopefully. Um, in some instances, the courts will have to work it out for us, given pending litigation. But my, my big concern is that we not over-lawyer the war fighting process. Um, so I hope I've answered your question. Any other questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Colonel Margaret Bond, I have a civil affairs background in Iraq. I uh, spent some time there working on rule of law issues. We spent a um, considerable amount of discussion today talking about some of the problems with bringing the right mix or balance or paradigm, if you will, on integrating civilian capabilities and developing rule of law with the military mm -hmm. capabilities. I'm sorry, I missed that. <laughs> We've, we've, we've wrestled with how to integrate civilian capabilities in developing rule of law with the military capabilities uh, in rule of law and stability operations. One of the things we've, we've noticed is that there seems to be um, difficulty in integrating the civilian agencies with the Department of Defense in terms of planning and operating. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us, uh, although it's early in the administration, on the uh, uh, current position within um, the Obama administration on reorganizing our capabilities or reorganizing the interagency process to better bring the all the elements of uh, national power into a, a, a coordinated effort for rule of law development and stability operations. For example, we, we've talked about um, a Goldwater Nichols approach to civil uh, interagency processes. We've talked about um, some of the other informal methods of bringing interagency processes to work. I wonder if you could tell what the current administration's approach to this will be. Well, um, to the extent that there is an imbalance, it's not, I mean, I, I, I think that um, getting a, an integrated interagency process um, is not, if it's, if it's slow, it's not because of lack of desire. I think we all want to see uh, a genuine integrated interagency process. Um, you know, the U.S. military was there first. Uh, we got a lot of people. Uh, and um, we'd all like to see um, this become a truly integrated process. We need, um, obviously, be nice to have a Senate-confirmed ambassador in Iraq. Um, we're getting there, but it's taking some time. And um, I think the desire is there among all the agencies. So um, I'd like to see us get there soon. I don't know if there's a defined policy about any particular emphasis. I know that state and justice uh, would like to um, be, be participants in this process. I, I met personnel from justice from state when I was in Iraq who are involved in our rule of law initiatives, and they're anxious to do more. So any other questions? Yes. Wait for my 
microphone. Sure. I'm having a discussion about who has Marine Corps voices. I don't think I have one of these done today. <laughs> um, I, let, me, let me throw you a, an easy international law question. Um, as, as you know, uh, one of the big debates um, of the last uh, eight years now almost um, has been over whether the law of armed conflict, the international law of conflict, is, is an adequate framework for the various kinds of challenges posed by the rise of globally diffused terrorist networks. Uh, do we, do we in, in your opinion, or to the extent that there is, it is an administration position that can be articulated at this point, uh, do, do we have the law that we need in terms of international law or do we need to rethink some aspects of the Geneva Conventions, et cetera, not to dilute the rights that we should be offering uh, to all human beings, but instead to recalibrate some of the tools that are available to a threat that has changed very significantly from an era in which most conflicts were between states? I think, in the, um, I think the answer to your question in the abstract in this post-9-11 world is probably not. We probably don't have all of the laws in place on a domestic or, or international level to cope with the post-9-11 world. Um, right now, in, in, in my world, in my job, um, um, Colonel Martins and I are dealing with the, um, the art of the possible within the time frame we've been given by the president. Uh, for our detention policy review, it's 180 days, and we've already chipped away 60 of those 180 days. For our uh, closing of uh, Guantanamo, we have 10 months. So um, we, we are thinking about those very issues. Uh, we're also thinking about um, what we can achieve and what we need to achieve in the, in the time permitted. So. Um, you know, we've got some big issues to wrestle with um, concerning, you know, long-term detention, concerning how detainees are prosecuted among those who are prosecutable, in what form. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if I could start from scratch on the international law playing field, or if I could start from scratch in Title 10, Title 18, uh, to deal with the post-9-11 world, I would probably write the laws a lot differently. Um, and um, at some point, maybe not in the life of my tenure as general counsel of the Defense Department, we will um, do that. So. Um, I'll ask another easy question. Um, uh, <laughs> that was so easy, it just seemed too much of a softball. Um, to, the, to what extent, uh, speaking obviously entirely on your own, to what extent do you think there is room for uh, a, a non-punishment uh, form of detention in these cases? I mean, there are, there are lots of problems People have pointed out lots of problems with the current detention policy. Some of those problems relate to holding people for too long. Some of those problems relate to the types of evidence that are used against them. But there is this fundamental tension between a law enforcement approach to detention and a security approach to detention, to, to use one of the words that are used. Right. So do you see any room at all for, for those two models to live in tandem and, and as a long-term solution? Or? Well, they, they lived in tandem pre November 2001, pre-September 2001, they lived in tandem. Um, and, you know, in my first go-around at the Pentagon uh, as general counsel of the Air Force, uh, the notion that you could detain a combatant until the cessation of hostilities was unchallenged, and no one thought to challenge it. No one thought to try to put that in a law enforcement Article Three way of thinking. Um, obviously, you know, things are less neat now, post 9-11. I um, tend to view these things, I said this in my Senate confirmation hearing, so I'm not, I guess I'm not giving up anything here, but um, I tend to view these things rather from, from the traditional model that, yes, we do need the authority, and I believe that the authorization for the use of military force gives us the authority 
uh, as informed by the Hamdi decision, to um, detain people indefinitely who are captured on the battlefield. I believe, however, that we need bright lines. And I believe that we need to embark on something where we don't change the rules of the game in the middle of the game. Uh, I won't refer to any particular cases, but um, we can't change the rules of the game in the middle of the game. And we need bright line authority, bright line rules. Um, so, and I think that one of the things that the new definition that we are using in court does is rather than decline to describe what the uppermost, uppermost limits of the authority is, are, we um, root it more basically in the congressional authorization as informed by international law. Rather than a definition that begins with the words, at a minimum, we can hold this, we can hold these category of people. Um, so um, I, think, I think the basic answer to your question is, is, is yes, that we necessarily need to be in a position to uh, detain certain categories of combatants captured on the battlefield, but I need there needs to be you know a, we need to establish where that line is, uh, for the reasons I said in my prepared remarks. Um, you give well-meaning government officials the discretion to decide whether or not you have a constitutional right, then that is subject to abuse, obviously. So, okay, uh, one last question. Yes, I'll be a little bit more of a hardball. Okay. And this goes back to your former life in the previous Democratic administration. Uh, I had spent five years in the war in El Salvador and saw an absolutely disgraceful situation where we always looked the other way when bad things were happening. And that was both my own military people and State Department people. Uh, then I had been in the Balkans from the beginning of the war there, uh, first as a humanitarian assistance person and then with the War Crimes Tribunal. Um, your comment about, and I understand you don't want to over-lawyer the war fighters, uh, but when we started the bombing in the former Yugoslavia in Kosovo, I was concerned and I talked to a lot of my JAG friends about are we better today? Are we better about how we're going to control this? And I was told, yes, we are. Targets have to be approved now by attorneys, which some people would argue that that's over lawyering. Uh, but then I was in Pristina two days after the Serbs left, and we had cluster bomblets scattered around Pristina uh, in an urban area occupied by civilians. And you know, not only was it, I thought, an inappropriate use of force, you know, there were a lot better munitions to use, but it was kind of a dumb thing. But we were involved at that time, apparently JAG people were involved at that time in looking at the targets that were being selected. But do you feel that at times they should also be looking at the way targets are engaged and the kinds of munitions that are being used? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there should be any question about that. Um, I'm, I'm not really in a position to comment on that specific episode, although I'm aware of it, but I think that as part of the analysis, uh, we should and we do look at the type of weapon that is being employed in a given situation, absolutely. Isn't that correct? Right. So, um, and we, you know, we have to be careful about this. Um, I think that um, it is not over-lawyering the process to engage in that type of analysis. And, um, you know, my, my concern is that when I say over-lawyering the process, that we not view the mission of the warfighter in the law enforcement model. I think that um, because we so much of the current system that we have in place was put in place along the way, um, a lot of legal thinking has gone into the analysis over time such that if we had if we had stood it all up at once in 2001 you know the, the military commissions process that we have in place now which um, to many could stand improvement but if we had stood it up all at once and just rolled up raised the curtain and boom look at this process we have lots of lawyers probably would not have 
given a whole lot of thought to it, but because of the way we, we embarked on this seven or eight year effort to kind of put it all in place through Supreme Court intervention and so forth, um, lots of lawyers have spent lots of time thinking about something that was a couple of generations ago a traditional war fighting element. And so um, that's what I mean when I say overlawing the process. Um, um, specific military ops and, and, and things of that nature, I, I think we need to be careful. Um, and I'm, I'm, I sleep better at night knowing that lawyers, you know, forward deployed and at the Pentagon look at these things and have an opportunity to, to weigh in on these things. So, okay. Mr. Johnson, it's been a tremendous honor to be the venue for your first major speech uh, since you became general counsel of the Department of Defense. And on behalf of uh, Georgetown and, and I'm sure on the behalf of the JAG School and University of Virginia Law School as well, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.